Amen. Well, thank you, team. Would you join me in just thanking them for leading us this morning? What a great time to worship. Man, and thank you, thank you for spending some of your 475 a gallon gas to come in here this morning uh, to be part of this. You know, we, we, we're going to try to give you everything that makes that worthwhile, but ultimately, what, what, what would you get out of church is what you put into it, not what we can give you. Amen. And I believe this morning what you put into the worship was just bringing value not only to, to the glory of God, but also to, uh, to each other. So thank you for being a part of this. I don't know about you, but being here at Grand Point for the last two weeks was a real, real blessing. Would you agree? Other than the fact that many of you, many of you asked me if I had my resignation letter ready. So that doesn't give me a whole lot of confidence. But the one thing that I'm confident about is that God is really working through Grand Point Church right now to raise up people, including the next generation for godly leadership. Would you agree with that? Now, last uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago on Mother's Day, Cressa, Cressa Coldsmith, uh, brought us the message from the book of Acts, telling us a story about Lydia and uh, how... How, and, and then challenged us to find our people that we would be able to invite into our homes in order to, have, uh, to, to experience a safe place for spiritual conversations, to find friends and make friends, and have access to the refrigerator. It doesn't get any better than that, right? And then last weekend uh, was Youth Takeover Sunday, and I hope you were as hope-filled as I was. There's this idea out there right now that we are losing the next generation, and that may be true in some cases, but I'm here to tell you that there is a remnant of students, including a whole bunch of them right here at Grand Point, who are in absolute love with God and are on fire for Him. And we saw that last week. Come on, every other... Yeah, you you can applaud that. You can applaud that. It's absolutely amazing. Now, I also want to remind you today that Satan is after them with everything that he's got. And that puts a responsibility on those of us who are, are older, more mature in our faith, those who are a part of Grand Point Church. We will do everything that we can to protect them, to walk alongside them, to help them in their journey toward that godly leadership. But I want to take this time to publicly thank you as a congregation this morning for your support to them. The way that you responded to Youth Takeover and uh, your support uh, last week was a valuable investment into the future of this church and the individuals who make up the next generation of leaders. Isn't it great to be part of Grand Point? Love this church, love what God's doing here, and uh, let me just give you a little little commercial about this coming summer. Uh, summer series is coming. It will begin in two weeks, and the summer series is called You Ask For It. So sometimes we're told within our preaching circles, right, with our education, stop answering questions that no one is asking, right? Well, this summer is not going to be that at all because we're going to be answering the questions that you are asking. And I received more than enough for a summer series. In fact, we could go a long time into this as well, but thank you for submitting those questions. What I'll do is next Sunday, I'm going to have a list of all those questions along with the date that they will be answered uh, for you so that you can maybe invite someone in that you think just has to hear the answer to this question or this question, or maybe there's a question that you're like, man, I'm out of here that weekend. So I want you to be able to know and kind of work your schedule uh, for that as well. But it's going to be a fun summer. And uh, thank you again for the questions that you submitted. Uh, Look forward to that as well. And can I tell you how excited I am for tonight? Tonight at 6.30 p.m. right here in this room is a worship night. We've had worship nights before here at the Shippensburg campus and the Greencastle campus. It is always a good thing when we come together to worship. But tonight is kind of special because, as Ryan said, we are going to be singing some of the songs that were written by our Grand Point worship team. We're going to be recording them. There's going to be cameras and microphones all over this place. It's going to become a studio, and we want you to become a part of it. Uh, We want a live audience that fills this room. So come on out tonight, 6.30 p.m., all worship, uh, and and you're going to love it. Some of you have been involved in in, uh, strategic plans. Maybe it was a strategic plan that was in your business or maybe in an academic circle or maybe even here at the church. I don't don't know. Uh, But uh, strategic plans are those moments 
when you sit down and plan a proactive strategy for how you're going to accomplish something. So in a business, you have a bottom line over here. You need to know how you're going to get there. So you bring in in the planning team, you put people around the table, and you put your heads together. You come up with this strategic plan because everybody in your business needs to know how you're going to get to that end result. And and we do that in church as well. We do that in other uh, places. Well, Acts, the book of Acts in the Bible is God's strategic plan. I believe that the book of Acts shows us exactly how God intended the end result to happen where many, many people come to know him as their Lord and as their Savior. And so what we've been doing in this series called Find Your People is we're using God's strategic plan, the book of Acts, and we're pulling out different stories from that book that tell us exactly how God is moving through his people. And in almost every one of these cases, it begins with the Lord saying, I want you to go. I want you to go. And there's a specific person or group of people that God calls us to go to right? And if we respond in obedience, amazing, amazing things happen. And I want to tell you yet another story about uh, that this morning. Uh, The book of Acts, again, is God's strategic plan, this proactive strategy. And uh, we read right after Jesus gave his followers many convincing proofs that he was alive, he said to them, now here's the beginning of the strategic plan. He said to these people, you will receive power. Not you might or not you can, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And again, you will, you will, not you might, not you could be, or this could be, but you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And usually when we hear that verse, we think about other people. Oh, that is for those disciple guys back in the book of Acts, those guys who lived in Jerusalem, who lived in Judea and Samaria. That's for them. But here's the thing. The overall strategy, when you consider the overall strategy of Jesus, he is saying to everyone who follows him in every age, I want you to get in the game. I want you to get in the game. I want you to find your people, and I want you to tell them. I want you to be my witnesses uh, for Jesus. Well, the people were doing that. That's what we're seeing through the book of Acts. They were doing that, and guess what? There was some opposition. Yeah, there was some kickback to this whole thing, and some of the opposition came from a guy by the name of Saul. So let me tell you about Saul. He's called sometimes Saul of Tarsus, and that's because he was born in Tarsus in a little city called Cilicia, which is modern-day Turkey. And he was born, it was about A.D. 5 when he was born, and in A.D. 10, when Saul was five years old, the family moved to Jerusalem. And then when he was, uh, you know, about 10, somewhere between 10 and 12, we read, like in the Bible, this, this story is told about him, he started studying the law, right? So he, he's like leaning into these, uh, these, uh, Ju- this Jewish law, and he was taught by this guy, this famous rabbi named Gamaliel. And you can read all about him in Acts chapter 5, verse 34. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. He was honored by all the people. And it was under Gamaliel that Saul would begin this in-depth study of the law uh, with this famous rabbi. So he's not some kid. Saul's not some kid that just spends all of this time in his room playing Mortal Kombat or Postal, right, video games. That's not what he is. No, he's going to school, and he's studying the law, the Jewish law. In fact, when he tells about himself in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, he's like, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was, watch this, extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I want you to note that word because to be extremely zealous is complimentary as long as it does not become misdirected. We've all seen extremely zealous people, haven't we? We've seen it in the, in the world of politics. And listen, Uh, Extremely zealous is wonderful when it leads to righteousness, when it leads people to God. But extremely zealous is a bad thing when it causes division, when it causes uh, people to tell lies, when it causes you to slander or or name call. That's when it becomes a a, a bad thing. But when zeal, however well intended, you know, leads to leads to a life, it, it's, it's a great thing. So rightly directed zeal brings life, misdirected zeal brings destruction. 
and sometimes death to people around them. Now, what Saul was studying was what we would call the Torah. The first five books of the Bible, that was the law. And some teachers believe that faithful observance to the Torah, right, following all the laws of that was the precondition of God's saving action. So they read the prophets, and they knew what the prophets of God were saying and what the prophets of God predicted. See, God, through the prophets, promised salvation and vindication to Israel. They promised this gathering of the tribes again, a restoration of the land, and an expulsion or a subjugation of all the foreign powers that had come in uh, to Israel. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright summarizes the situation. And he says it like this. He says, the Jewish leaders... Now, again, keep in mind, this is what Saul was who Saul was learning from. This was his world right now. The Jewish leaders and the revolutionaries in general were eager to bring all of these prophecies to fulfillment. But the problem was they got tired of waiting on God. And so they took matters into their own hands. And that kind of summarizes this whole situation. They're like obeying the Torah would hasten the time of the fulfillment of all these prophecies and promises that God was making. So if God were to act climactically now within history, while Israel was still not keeping the Torah properly, she would be condemned along with the other Gentiles. That's what they believed. Well, it seems like Saul fell under the influence of these, uh, of these teachers and ideas like this. And so here come the disciples of Jesus right? And they're not necessarily keeping the law anymore. They're not observing the Sabbath laws, right? They're, in fact, even Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. The disciples were going out and picking grain on the Sabbath, and all of that was against the law. So these law guys, right, Saul included, were looking at this and like, man, the disciples of Jesus are, 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 are destroying the law. They're going to destroy our, our religion. They're violating these laws, And so Saul believed, this is exactly what they believed, that such heretics should do one of two things. Number one, they should either adopt a strict observance to the law, we're going to keep the law, we're going to do this, or they should die. Those were the two options. Uh, And and the the reason that death was one of the options was because if if these people came in, they're, they're now going to bring divine judgment down on the rest of the nation. If you break the law, you're going to be an obstacle to the fulfillment of the prophecies of the coming of Christ. So they looked at these lawbreakers as an impediment to the destiny of Israel. Now, understanding all of that background helps us understand Saul in Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9, where you read about his story. In Acts chapter 7, there's this guy by the name of Stephen. Stephen is described as a man that's full of God's grace and power, and he gave this amazing speech to the Sanhedrin, which was the lawyers and the guys that are out there. He gave this amazing speech to them, and in his speech, he's saying, okay, you guys have the law, right? You know the law, but yet you're missing the Holy Spirit, and therefore, you have a misdirected zeal. Well, how do you think that went over? That didn't go over good at all. So they're like, this guy is speaking against us. He's speaking against the law. Right? He's not holding to the law. And so they decide to put him to death. They decide to stone Stephen to death. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was there approving of their killing him. In fact, he was even holding their coats. He's like, here, I'll hold your jacket. Yes, yeah, so you can throw the stones a little bit better. That's, that, that's, that was it. Now, in Acts chapter 8, verse 2, it says, Godly men buried Stephen, and they mourned deeply, deeply for him. But look what Saul did. He began to destroy the church. He went from house to house, and he dragged off both men and women, and he put them in prison. Now, fast forward to Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, and now he goes to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues. This would be like arrest warrants. And and they gave them to him, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way or belonged to Jesus and the church, whether man or woman, he might drag them out and take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. 
So I want you to see now what Saul is doing. He is so extremely zealous for the law. He believes that this is the right way to go. He's putting his heart, soul, mind, and strength into this, everything that he's got. And if anyone disobeys the law, he's going to put them to death. So that's the scenario. That's where he's at right now. He's extremely, extremely religious. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So the Lord speaking. The first thing I want you to notice is how the Lord takes persecution against his church. He says, why are you persecuting who? Me. Why are you persecuting me? Jesus does not see the church as an it. He does not see the church as a building. He sees it as me. Jesus has so united himself to his church that they're one and the same. And that's going to throw Saul off a little bit, right? Because he's not expecting this. And so he's like, oh, oh, wait, wait a minute. Who are you? Right? He hears this voice. Doesn't understand where it's coming from. And so he asks, and and Jesus answers in verse 5. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. There's no distinction between Jesus and the church, which means that there's no separation of love for Jesus and commitment to his church. Jesus even calls the church his bride. And listen, you can't love Jesus and hate his bride any more than you can tell me, hey, PL, hey, we think you're great. We'd like to have you over for dinner. But that skank penny, right? We don't like... (laughs) She's not able to come along. Listen, that's not going to happen, right? If I'm coming, Penny's coming because we're one, right? Probably it's the other way around for most of you. You'd like to have Penny over. Leave me out of it. But listen, I say that because there's people out there who say, man, I love the Lord. I love Jesus, but man, I hate the church. I'm not going to church. Church is a bunch of hypocrites or the church hurt me, you know, at one point in the past. I'm never going back there again. And listen, I think Jesus will be saying right now, listen, you can't love me and not love the church. Jesus says, I and the church are the same. In fact, the church is the body of Christ. You cannot be in love with Jesus and not be in love with his church. So Saul hears this. And and so he says, who is this? Who's speaking to me? And Jesus says, It is Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now, get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. Verse 7, there were men who were traveling with him. They also heard the voice, but they didn't see anyone. So they stood there speechless. Saul got up from the ground, and then when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. He was blind. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, just very quickly, let me summarize before we move on. I want you to get the picture here. Saul the mighty, man, the man with the agenda, taking matters into his own hands, now kneeling before God. Saul, the one man that he thought, he saw so clearly, man, he had the plan. This was the only way that you could do it. This was the only way that religion worked, right? Now clearly being led by his hand because he's blind. Saul, the one who kicked in doors, man, and dragged other people out, is now seized by the Lord himself. Saul, the hammer, who broke others, is now being broken himself. So his friends are leading him to Damascus. In verse 10, we're introduced to a new character in the story. Verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision and said, Ananias. Listen, whenever the Lord calls you by name, listen up. I don't know that I've ever heard the Lord say, hey, PL, or hey, Lawrence, I want you to do something. I'm not sure that I've ever heard him say my name, but I know when he's speaking to me. And, and so do you. The very moment that you gave your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, you knew something was going on inside of you, right? There was a conviction that came over you. There was this sense that I've got to give my life to Jesus. That was the Lord calling your name at that moment. And some of you know exactly what it's like for God to call your name. He uses circumstances that are unique to you. And whenever there's a circumstance or something that comes that's unique to you, it's kind of God calling your name. So so there's ways that he calls our name, and he did that here. He says, Ananias, and Ananias said, "Here, here I am, Lord. 
which by the way is the perfect response to the Lord calling your name. Here I am, and the Lord said to him, hey, I want you to rise, and here it is, here's the, here's the admonition, go to the street called Straight at the house of Judas, and look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he's praying. And Ananias said, say what? For a moment there, <laughs> Lord, I thought, I thought you said I was supposed to go and meet up with Saul. Good one, Jesus. The Lord says, no, that's exactly what I said. See, that would be like Jesus saying to me, hey, I, Pastor Lawrence, I want you to go up to the Mountain House Bar and Grill, and there's a guy sitting up there in a Harley. It's Friday night about 11 o'clock, and I want you to go over to him and invite him to, to church. Now, that might be a really, really poor analogy, so let me explain very, very quickly. Listen, I love Harley people. Harley people are some of the best people in the world. Would you agree? Anybody here, anybody here riding a Harley? Everyone else was afraid to raise their hands in the other services because you don't know where I was going with this. Nothing at all against Harleys. And by the way, this is nothing at all against Mountain House Bar and Grill. I heard they have great Philly cheesesteaks and Mountain House Popper Toppers. Good place to go to eat. Here's the reason I'm using this. I came past there one Friday night. That place was packed with bikers, Harley people, leather. I mean, all kinds of stuff over there. And again, I love those Harley people. It's just not my kind of people, right? They're intimidating to me. So I look at all of those bikers up there and it's just like, man, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable going in there. See, now, and I'm a cyclist, but, but, and I always had this dream of riding up that mountain and stopping there, maybe getting a drink. And then to, before I turn around and come back down, but I'm just not sure that my little spandex shorts are going to hold up there with all of that leather in that place. If that was a whole bunch of other cyclists, yes, I could go in there, but not with the Harley crowd, right? You see what I mean? They're just not my people, right? And so Ananias says to the Lord, okay, that's not my kind of person, right? Sometimes God is going to call you to go to somebody that's not like you. Now, if God calls me and tells me clearly to do that, in fact, I already had one guy offer to pick me up on his Harley and take me there. I, I'm serious. I, you know, that, I feel comfortable doing that because I'm going with someone that kind of fits in there, right? But sometimes God's going to call you to go to someone. It might be that person that lives across the street. And you're like, man, I heard some things about them. You've never met them. They're your neighbors, but you've never met them because they're like, they're like rich or they're like poor. Or you heard something about them, and they're like, you've already made up in your mind they're not your kind of people, so you're not going there. You're not even going to introduce yourself to them. But what if, what if God calls you to go to someone who's not like you? Someone who's intimidating, right? And, and what, what are you going to do with that? Well, that's exactly the scenario here. So the Lord says to Ananias, hey, go down to Straight Street and look for the man of Tarsus named Saul. He's not on a Harley, but he's on his knees. For behold, he's praying. And verse 12, it says, in this vision, he's seen a man named Ananias. Like, in other words, he's already expecting someone to come. He, he sees in this vision, this guy by the name of Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. And Ananias says in verse 13, Lord, I don't mean to object, but you know what he did? Do you know what he did? He's kind of asking the Lord. You know, sometimes we have to tell the Lord stuff, Right? Lord, you know what he did, right? Because of what he did, I shouldn't go there. And that's kind of how we roll, isn't it? We hear things. We hear things. Oh, did you hear about what they did? Did you hear about that person? And we have all of these. Did you hear about them? And, and, and when we do that, we make all these conclusions about people. You don't even know them. You never even met them. You didn't have the decency to go and meet them and find out for yourself. You just make assumptions because of what you heard. Right, And so you categorize these people, and they're like, they're not my people. I'm not going there. I'll never invite them to my house. And so that's exactly what Ananias says. He says to the Lord, I've heard. I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And now he's come here with all authority from all the chief priests to arrest all who call my name. You know what Ananias is saying? He says, Lord, he's not my kind of people. He's intimidating. He's wearing leather. He's up there in the mountain house eating popper toppers. He's killed people, right? That's not who I'm going to, but that's kind of what we do, isn't it? But look at verse 15. The Lord said to Ananias, no, go. Go, man. He's he's your man. It's amazing how many times, how much time church leaders in Acts spent arguing with Jesus. But now look at the rest of the verse. The Lord said to him, go, for this man is my what? 
chosen instrument. You have got to be kidding me. This man, this man that was killing Christians, this man that was persecuting Christians, the Lord looks at him and says, this is my chosen instrument. This is the guy who's going to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Listen, that one person, that one person that God might be calling you to go to, that you've already concluded is not my kind of people. Lord, did you hear about them? Do you know what they did? Listen, that one person might just be God's chosen instrument that God is going to use to change a life, to change a family, to change a community, and maybe even to change a nation. And all God is waiting for is for you, for you and me to go. Pray over them right? And allow their spiritual blindness to be taken away so that they now see and know the truth. Give their hearts and the rest of their lives to Christ and make a difference. What if, what if that one person that God has been prompting you to go to is that person, is God's chosen instrument? By the way, God never uses the predictable when choosing his people. The ones that we see as being the right one for the job are usually the last ones on his list. God likes to use the least unlikely people. I mean, just remember, think of David. His dad didn't even include him in the lineup when Samuel came to choose the king. He wasn't even included. He was too young. He was too unlikely. Think of the disciples. They were lowly fishermen. Man, they were tax collectors. But, but I'll tell you, Saul takes the cake. He is on his way to persecute Christians in Damascus when he becomes God's chosen instrument. Who would have ever thought? Well, certainly not Ananias, but the Lord says, or yeah, the Lord says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. There's nothing at all in this guy that would give any indication he was qualified to do this. Well, look at verse 17. Then I, Ananias went. I love this. Your obedience to the voice of God has amazing, amazing results. Ananias went to the house. He entered it, right? He's obedient. He appears before Saul, and he has this great privilege of laying his hands on him and praying over this broken man in the name of the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, Saul's blindness is ended, and there's a symbol that his spiritual blindness was ended. He's baptized, most likely by the hands of Ananias. And then we read that Saul spent some days or several days with the disciples at Damascus. And whether at this point Saul was now the student or the teacher, we don't know. Perhaps he sat and he learned from Ananias. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what's significant is at this point, Ananias disappears. He's done. He's done. Right? His role in the drama of Acts is very, very small, but it's significant. He's gone. Now, here's what I want you to know. When it comes to finding your person, don't think of it as some big event that you need to plan. Don't stress out over this. I mean, don't think of that worst person out there now that you have to go and speak to. Don't stress out about going to mountaintop, barn, you know, whatever it is. Listen, just let God guide you. Let God guide you in that. See, he, he likes to use, you know, he likes to use uh, the least likely people. And don't even think of some qualification that you need to have in order to do this. Oh, you don't need to know the Bible from front to end. You don't need to have this thing memorized. You don't even have to have all the answers to their questions. No, you just go. And listen, don't even think of it as some qualification they need to have. Just do what God prompts you to do. Man, when God lays, you see that neighbor out there and, and there's something in you that says, man, I really should go talk to them. You know what that is? That's God calling your name saying, go, go. When you see somebody at work and man, you, you know, they're the most unlikely people. You just, you know, you don't want to cross their paths. You've never had a conversation with them. Maybe, just maybe, maybe God's going to at some point prompt you and say, you know, sit down and talk to them or hang out with them after work or do something. That's God calling your name and saying, go. Who knows? They might be God's chosen instruments. All we're waiting for is you. Well, Ananias was the one who heard God say, go. Go find your person, just one person, down there on Straight Street, and just pray for them. Just pray for them and ask God to remove the blindness from their eyes so that they can see the truth and the goodness of God. 
And even though Ananias was like, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. He's not my kind of person. We don't have anything in common. He, he submitted himself and his very life to God's call, and God did the rest. God did the rest. And God used this man to further his purposes. You know, uh, some of you might know that Saul, later his name was changed to Paul, right? And Saul means great, but Paul means small. It really does. That's what it means. So he went from this great guy to kind of this small category, but God used him in amazing ways. You read the rest of Acts, man. He started missionary journeys, and he went here and here and here, and he had all these people come around him, and people came to know the Lord. He started churches all over Asia Minor. We have the books of the Bible like Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, all written by this guy, God's chosen instrument, all because there was one person named Ananias who responded to God's call to go. That was it. He went, and God used that moment of obedience in Ananias' life to transform this other, the life of Saul, this murderer guy, right? And God used him in incredible ways for a harvest of his kingdom. So here's a lesson I want to leave you with this morning. One small act of obedience to God's voice prompting you to go to someone even if they're not your kind of person, can be the contact that changes a life, that changes a family, that changes a community, and maybe even changes our nation. What are you going to do? Let's pray together. God, today is a good reminder, man, that you've just filled our lives with purpose We say this all the time here at Grand Point. We're not just here to consume resources. We're not just here to collect things. We're not just here to kind of just enjoy all the pleasures that life and our culture offers us. I mean, all of those things are appropriate and a part of our lives, but they're not the main reason why we're here. The main reason why we are here is to be those people who go. And, and talk to people and make a difference in other people's lives. Just encourage them and pick them up and just maybe even pray over them. Introduce them to Christ. God, what a great, great honor that is. What a great privilege it is uh, to be able to be so purposeful with our lives. And God, my prayer would be that right now, right now, you would just give us listening ears and help us to listen well to the person that you're calling us to go to. Maybe it's like Lydia, where we just simply open up our home and invite people in for dinner. God, give us the names of those people that we are to invite. Maybe it's like Scott challenged us last week to find your student. Maybe it's just writing a note to one of the students that was a part of our service last week and just saying, thank you. We've noticed a gift of God in you just Work it out. Work it out. I'm praying for you. Maybe it's now someone that, you're, that, that God's going to put into our hearts and minds that is not like us at all. I mean, we're, we're now called to someone who intimidates us, someone who kind of feel that, that threatens us, someone who's not like us, but nevertheless is still God's chosen instrument. And God, use us as your people to make a difference and to build your kingdom. Amen.